with various databases and provided access and integrated them. So making that data available in order to derive value out of it on, a, on our day-to-day -day operations. We have, uh, of course, customs clearance data. We, we are also having wealth of information available in the supply chain uh, through GST data. E-way bill data is now available. Adwet, we have developed one data analytics platform called Adwet that is providing a lot of insight into the data, the valuation data, the offense data, which was lying in silos, number of cases, as you know, being detected almost on a daily basis. And then we also started uh, connecting uh, and, and collaborating with our, our partner government agencies, uh, be it the income tax department or animal quarantine, food and safety, plant quarantine, uh, Wildlife Crime Bureau, uh, Textile Committee, all of that, because DGFT, of course, more prominently, they have a direct role in the management of international and domestic supply chains. So to, to, to use this data revolution in spotting new and emerging trend in terms of the risk on a real-time basis, this is what we are doing at my center, that is National Customs Targeting Center. And we deploy a whole host of technologies to uh, leverage that data, various databases. Now, uh, I was asked to, to uh, present a few slides. Uh, what I would uh, do is just to showcase a few use cases, particularly in the context of e-commerce and overall supply chain management. So uh, just allow me to, to, to share some slides here yeah, for Can you see these slides? Are you able to see? Yes. yes. Right. So right. Talking yes. about e-commerce and the theme of the session is how to solve the problems of the supply chain. This is a problem statement in a typical e-commerce supply chain, which is increasing. And this is equally applicable in the Indian context. Our challenge is that with the, with the tsunami of parcels coming through courier, uh, express services and post, how we manage the speed and efficiency. As a consumer, which we are all buying uh, goods, if not selling through e-commerce at least, we want immediate delivery of goods. Our, our consumers, our customers are getting impatient. Just from the customs and uh, border regulatory point of view, we have to ensure that efficiency. A container, full load container, having, let's say, 50,000 pieces of laptops, is now fragmented into 50,000 individualized parcels. So we are talking about 50,000 importers, 50,000 suppliers, and per, as a to one importer and shipper that we were dealing with in the past. Now we are talking about 50,000 set of documents. At the same time, we have to also manage the risk because in the past, in the traditional supply chain, which is still running, of course, you knew broadly who are the people who in the supply chain, big importers, exporters, overseas suppliers. But today, every individual, every citizen can be your importer. So to manage the risk, and the, the also we have to understand the, the level of their understanding about the supply chain and the regulatory processes. So data quality issues. And it, to ensure that the parcel reach it to their doorstep well, as soon as possible. We are talking about 24 hours, 48 hours, end-to-end -end delivery. That's the supply chain efficiency we are talking about. So we have to manage all of the risk, including security, safety, revenue risk, but at the same time, enhance the facilitation. Fair and revenue collection is another area, as opposed to collecting revenue on bulk shipment, collecting revenue on a small, small shipments, and more importantly, please bear in mind, when an individual places an order in the e-commerce environment, we expect that the price given on the, uh, on the web platform uh, or e-vendors uh, platform is the final price. Often there are challenges and they get surprised. We see day-to-day -day disputes about the who will pay the duties and taxes. And why should I pay? I have paid everything, whatever I had to pay at the time of placing the order. So the, those challenges are there. The challenges in terms of the classification, I don't want to go in more technical issues. If if we had a whole army of uh, custom brokers and intermediaries helping the big businesses and the traditional supply chain, put yourself as an individual when we're placing, how will you know that 
uh, mobile phone in under what chapter heading needs to be classified what is the version you don't know you are placing order to a platform uh, they might be procuring goods from uh, x country and actually the goods might have been manufactured in third country so this is the complexity of the supply chain we are talking about and then we also noted that the e-commerce supply chain and with with all its benefits which has really provided immense opportunities to our uh, smes individuals and consumers in terms of connecting to the global supply chain but it is also bringing up a lot of opportunities for unscrupulous sellers illicit trade drug trafficking uh, ipr infringed goods illicit financial flows all of that we see it on a day to day basis so we have to manage that as well now how the te how technology can help in that obviously uh, it's it's complex architecture there are multiple stakeholder and that's where technologies like blockchain as it was indicated in the opening session provides and takes away the fear of unknown provides trust amongst unknown people individuals and stakeholders it provides the provenance of the data the traceability the consensus approach so all of that if we see there are number of uh, players connected in the supply chain if they all come on board and they start populating their data and everyone having equal visibility clearly it it has a huge assurance today we are getting data in silos from different stakeholder you have one set of uh, information with the e platform and that set of information perhaps going to logistics operator uh, those are your uh, express services and postal operator and maybe an, a third set of information which is actually being fed into custom declaration system we do not have the ability to leverage all of the data and there are inconsistencies and gaps some uh, unknowingly and some deliberately which is having a huge risk in the supply chain and also then adding cost and time to that so chain clearly offers a solution having that visibility and much early in the supply chain today i don't know until a declaration is filed what is coming to the country we are trying for advanced electronic information we are trying for prior uh, filing of the bills but in the courier environment at least it is still not happening so many a times and my colleagues will perhaps uh, give more details on that it even only after the parcel has landed the declaration is filed and that takes time for clearance at the same time as i indicated earlier on the huge data and particularly in the e-commerce environment the, the electronic data that is available at our disposal how we can uh, utilize it. and that's where the ai ml comes and provides a lot of opportunities to utilize that data and that helps if if there is no risk yes why not the cargo or the parcel can be cleared instantly it's more effective more cost effective we can take better and timely quick decisions and wherever there are risk and we do predictive modeling uh, using ml and I'll, I'll demonstrate in a while that helps us to to know which shipment is risky and which is not so this is just one use case which we are already implemented in our risk management environment we have codified all of the data all of the suppliers all of buyers importers all descriptions though it was very challenging because the data quality at least when it comes to description of the goods is not very good often people would not know gift and gift does not have any meaning to us it could be 1 dollar pen to a million dollar diamond ring so uh household goods it does not have any meaning to me but we made a lot of effort or uh, you know piecing through the unstructured data we codified majority of them and today based on the codification of all of the data and utilizing machine learning utilizing the uh, database historical database we are able to identify any anomaly or gap in a real time basis if it is with regard to classification of the goods comparing with the identical goods in the past valuation of the goods levy of custom duty igst entry dumping whatever it is and this is all happening in a real time environment through machine learning there absolutely no human intervention moving on to uh, to more specific e-commerce environment what we noted there are new actors we are not used to some of those new actors that have joined in the supply chain 
custom and some of the other regulatory agencies in the supply chain, they never dealt with. We have e-platform. They are, we are talking about cross-border, they are overseas. We have never dealt with them. So how to connect and, and, and get the data from those new actors? This is what we have been trying. Uh, if you look, take the example of e-platform. Clearly, they, they have the, we are looking at three kinds of data, order data, payment data, and shipping data. Order data is available the moment any customer, any buyer, including all of us, checks out the order at the e-platform. Payment data is also there because you have already paid for that. Shipping data is that next step when the platform or the buyer or the vendor connects with one of the logistics supplier. It could be express service, postal operator. So our approach is that how we can get the data as early as possible in the supply chain. And if all of these stakeholders are connected on blockchain, then this data, they don't have to necessarily push for it. We don't have to go and individually, uh, you know, have agreement or some kind of set up uh, connecting platform or APIs to pull the data. This data is instantly available. There are uh, pilots going on, including Korea, where the moment e-commerce order is placed, the order data itself gets converted into the custom declaration data. There's no need for someone to file and their declares. And the advantages, we see all the stakeholder are, are on the platform are pushing the data to custom and other government agencies. Efficient facilitation of all legitimate shipment, no need for any intervention. Through smart contracts, they can be instantly cleared without involving any custom officer or any FSSI or any other officer. Efficient and of course, effective risk management, we are able to pin down to precise risk, efficient revenue collection. So we can also have algorithm running to collect the duties and taxes mapping with our tariff and, and, the, and the date of duty and improved compliance. Now, moving on to just stressing in the interest of time. Sorry. So uh, one of the things we also do network analysis uh, and using uh, ML techniques in the in the e-commerce environment and just to give you one case the misuse of kyc my aadhaar card being used by for getting goods through e-commerce through courier and that is clearly not acceptable this is a huge risk to us and this connectivity has given us deeper insight because obviously when 30000 uh, parcels documents filed on each it's impossible humanly to get into and to come up with that kind of, uh, you know, network or, or um, at least the bad network which is operating in the supply chain. So we have demonstrated and we are able to get that deeper insight in a real time basis. The other thing which we, this is something which we envisage not yet fully done. Uh, the, the POC is underway. We are trying to train the machine through machine learning by giving them all kinds of images relating to the real product, be it arms, ammunition, cigarettes, gold, silver, even fabric, polyester fabric, woven fabric, knitted fabric. So machine itself will, uh, when the image is captured in real time, it will, uh, it will look into the past images, historical images for which it has been trained to look at the declaration, what it is declared currently, and the animal. And we have seen such cases a knife being declared as pen. And obviously the machine knew what, what is the image of a pen and a knife. So they could clearly point out. So POCs have been very promising and this is our next step to go ahead. And alongside, we are also looking at it that how we can identify these products precisely and even classify them using AI ML. We can, using the weight validation cargo, a, a set of, uh, let's say mobile phones in a pack, uh, in, in a container pack, package of a given volume will have certain amount of average weight. Now, if there are deviant behavior, obviously that's a risk. Either the product is misdeclared or something else is being brought in, smuggled in. Now, finally, I want to leave with the uh, last two slides. Block how in general, e-commerce and particularly in general supply chain. Today for filing a custom declaration, a broker or a company having their own whole army of people 
collecting data from several sources, bill of lading, airway bill, payment uh, invoice, all licenses here and there, and then putting them in the form of a custom declaration called bill of entry. And when it comes to export called shipping bill. Now, if the actors, various actors in the supply chain, they are already in the supply chain. So this, this process is having data gaps, having errors, sometime inadvertently, sometime deliberately. But if these actors are on the supply chain, then clearly all of the data is available. And on the platform itself using a smart contract or algorithm, the data will be collated and it will be put in the form of custom there's clearly no need to submit a declaration. This is what we are envisioning. And few countries have already done a lot of pilots in this. Korea is doing, IBM Max has done trade lens. Of course, more and more custom and regulatory agencies also need to do such pilots and see how useful it would be. And if we connect this blockchain, either we run it on our own on the behalf of government, or we connect with the blockchain run by private stakeholder. So for example, in Indian context, if we connect our SWIFT, which is the single environment where custom and all the government agencies are operating currently with let's say trade lens, and we get the data on a real time basis, we manage the risk and the goods get automatically clear. The other use case is the implementation of uh, free trade agreements. And we have signed several free trade agreements. Government is vigorously, more recently we signed uh, with UAE, now Australia, UK, they're all on card. Now, based on the previous experience, there have been a number of issues, including a lot of misuses of FTA provisions. Every day I see uh, under us, Indo-ASEAN, I don't want to call out the name, but if you take uh, uh, Indo-ASEAN agreement, goods of third country version are coming and claiming benefits. This is clearly not good for any of the partners in the, and clearly not for our revenue and, uh, uh, and overall you know, uh, economy. Now, if these actors, and starting from the uh, manufacturer and producer, they are all on uh, blockchain, we get at what price the inputs and from which country they were imported, what value addition took place. So for example, if this value addition requirement of 30% for, and FTA, it's all get calculated in the uh, on the blockchain platform itself, and there is the 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 efficient inefficiency associated with the certificate of origin, the the manipulation, the fraud, uh, the value addition norms being incorrectly declared. All of that will go away very briefly. We also have various agreements with various countries, including authorized economic operator and mutual recognition agreement. Obviously, when uh, many of you would be aware, when I say authorized economic operator, each country has its own program, including in we based on the validation and the compliance level, we certify those traders, those uh, those importers and exporter, and we provide them enhanced facilitation. Now you share that list with your partner country, and partner country shares that list with you. That can happen in a real time environment through blockchain. And those partner uh, trusted traders of respective countries can get enhanced facilitation instantly in a real time environment without any human intervention. So I stop here. I think I've already oversought my time. And this can equally be applied for payment and settlement solution. And some of the banking and financial is already utilizing. Thank you very much. Do you have any question, comments? I welcome that. And thank you for this opportunity once again. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, if there be any questions, I'll definitely uh, bring that up. Uh, I'm now going to move on to the next uh, keynote by Mr. Akhilesh Pandey, sir. Uh, sir, you are working as additional director general as the West, at the West Zonal uh, Unit Systems, Mumbai. You've done BTEC honors in mechanical engineering from uh, IIT Varanasi, and you're an IRS officer of 2000 Batch. You've earlier served the department in various capacities, at Customs Port of Mumbai, JNPT, Kolkata, at RMCC, and DGCEI. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Swati. Uh, am I audible to all of you? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Thank you, Swati. A very good morning to uh, ADG, mighty Mr. Thakur sir, ADG, NCTC, uh, Mr. P. N. Pandey sir, Mr. Meena, Director, NECT, and uh, participants from EICI, uh, Mr. Amit, participants from DHL, Mr. Vasudevan, and all the distinguished participants for this uh, session. At the outset, I'll uh, thank the organizers of MIT to give me this opportunity to speak on this session. I'll give a very brief introduction on AI and blockchain and present the use case of its use in ECCS, which is Express Cargo Clearing System. Uh, the tone has been set very rightly by Pandey sir by giving in-depth uh, detail of the use of AI and blockchain in customs department. We all are aware that artificial intelligence and blockchain are the cutting edge latest technologies. Artificial intelligence leverages computers and machines to mimic the problem solving and decision making capabilities of the human mind. While blockchain is a shared immutable ledger that facilitates the process of recording transactions and tracking assets in a business world. Blockchain is ideal for delivering the information because it provides immediate, shared, and completely transparent information, which is stored on immutable ledger, and it can be accessed only by the permission network members. AI and blockchain make our existing process of customs clearance system more smoother. It reduces the dwell time, which is the time of clearance of goods. It mitigates the risk of human errors and secures the data. AI has multiple steps to achieve desired results like data exploration, data modeling, and data for AI trading using reinforcement, deep learning, and deployment. The future vision of CBIC is to make a hybrid system with AI and blockchain. The blockchain will enable us, all the stakeholders of export and import value chain as node and have transparent data flow. AI can automate customs clearance process ex export and import ends with help of computer vision at scanning point of goods and matching it with the given HS code and description with the help of natural language processing, which is known as NLP. If the description and the HS code is matched with the scan data, it will be facilitating the consignment. And in case there's any discrepancy, it will flag the goods and alert the custom staff on duty. This will identify and flag the restricted goods at the time of scanning and raise alert for the same, which can be used to reduce the dual type of clearance. Now I'll specifically explain the use of these technologies by CBIC through the Express Cargo Clearance System. The Express Cargo Clearance System or ECCS, as it is called in short form, is an application that enables automated custom clearance in courier mode under Courier Import and Export Regulations 2010. This application cuts down the cost of doing business and ensures rapid movement of goods across frontiers. ECCS has successfully contributed towards increasing trade volume, debilitating paperwork, and reducing dwell time, resulting in clearance of consignment within a few hours. ECCS has been built on cutting edge technology products. It ensures faster clearance, better compliance of rules, and ensures data reporting and enhanced data security. Some of the key features of this application are, is, is that it is a 100% paperless clearance, the duty payment, the uploading of all documents is done online. There is no manual processing at any end. As on date, at approximately nine international customs terminal across the country, including Mumbai, Delhi, and Bangalore as the main ICTs, approximately 45,000 shipments are cleared per day in import and export through the courier module in ECCS. It has the automated risk management system and nearly more than 90% of shipments are facilitated, which means they are cleared without any customs intervention. And that module is being managed by Mr. Pandey, my previous speaker. The couriers file the courier bill of entry in courier shipping bill through bulk upload, which means multiple number of documents can be filed in one go through this bulk upload facility. 
the database is highly secured through audit ball technology this completely online and paperless application allows upload of invoice price list customs clearance documents query reply duty payment online it is a single and common web based digital application for all stakeholders which are the courier companies the customs and the custodians so it has many automated feature like auto oc or auto leo which means that any consignment which is compliant which from the risk management division are cleared as safe and during the x ray is also comes as clear not suspicious it goes out of charge of customs area or auto let or export order without any intervention by officer at any stage and more than 90% of consignments today in courier mode are cleared through this mode ecs provides real time monitoring and visibility to customs officers leading to greater trade facility and trans transparency the technical part is that this application has been developed in state of the art java technology using struts egb and jasper the operating system of these servers are enterprise version of linux like rhel 7.7 and oel 7.4 on the back the data is stored and managed in oracle database eccs has 24 by 7 integrated help desk for importers and exporters to address their grievances and to resolve application related issues of the end users all the real time consignments in eccs can be tracked through e mobility app by entering only the airway bill number and the courier name any person can get the status of their consignments on internet as of now the facilitation percentage in import is approximately 88% and export is 94% and the dwell time for import is roughly 12 5 hours and export it is 4 hours so you have to appreciate the speed of this uh, express industry wherein hours the goods are cleared from the customs control regarding the use of ai and ml the cbic our board is envisaging the use of artificial intelligence chatbot to identify the best communication channel and messages to reply to the queries of eccs users so any query coming from through the help desk can be automatically replied through this chatbot similarly cbic is envisaging the use of convolutional neural network during x ray image scanning so this cnn is similar to regular neural network and are inspired by biological processes and mainly used in image and video recognition image classification natural language processing on a global scale these images can be transferred to blockchain also cbic is also investing the use of artificial intelligence technology to bring optimization of transportation path and improve the delivery efficiency the use of information can make the whole operational traceable process controllable and result predictable the big data analysis and machine learning can optimize and improve the existing operation process based on the historical data and can also help to identify the risk and the pattern for the counterfeit goods the blockchain technology can be used for process automation transparency traceability and authenticity of the courier shipment the express industry can be more efficient and faster by using this blockchain technology through the customs clearance by reducing the processing time for goods at the customs check post at the end i believe express industries need to leverage these new technologies and embrace ways of rethinking old processes in the digital area the successful operation of artificial intelligence machine learning and blockchain has the potential to bring transformation by making the system smarter secure and automated thank you thank you for this opportunity i look forward for any questions or doubts later on thank you Thanks a lot, Akhilesh sir. Uh, if any questions come up, I will certainly bring them up. Uh, and now we move on uh, to our next session, uh, where we are going to learn about how blockchain can revolutionize uh, supply chain structures and the customs environment, which is a vital part of today's uh, supply chain. Uh, and now I'm uh, very honored to invite our distinguished speaker, Mr. Nantha Kumar Govind Sami. I'm sorry, sir. It's been uh, it took some time. Uh, probably we were short some time here. Uh, I'll give a very quick introduction about you. Mr. Nantha is the director of international trade policies for Asia Pacific region 
He leads Intel's trade policy, digital initiatives, and ESG advocacy in the region to effectively influence trade laws, regulation, and other government policies that align to Intel's business and operations, supply chain, market access needs, and overall strategy and business of, of, uh, objectives. With this, with this brief introduction, sir, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Swati. Good day to everyone. Uh, Dr. Vinay Thakur, CEO, NEGD, Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India. Speakers from Ministry of Finance, Mr. P.N. Pandey, Additional Director General and Directorate General of Analytics and Risk Management. Mr. Akhilesh Pandey, <coughs> Additional Director General, West Zonal Unit Systems, Mumbai. Mr. Abhishek Singh, President and CEO, NEGD, MD and CEO, Digital India Corp. Audience member, Ministry of Finance, Central Board of India, Indirect Taxes, Ministry of Housing, Agriculture, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Defense, Commerce, Housing and Urban Affairs, members from the academia, friends and colleagues from the industry, a very good morning to all. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to share some of Intel's digital initiatives relating to uh, supply chain and customs. I think the first respected three gentlemen has summarized the whole scenario so well uh, and I'm finding it difficult to speak. I don't know what to say, uh, but it's amazing how India is, is far leaping and aggressively adopting technology, uh, especially the supply chain uh, era. And this is something that we are ambitiously, Intel is ambitiously driving to create that awareness, especially among the ASEAN members, how adopt how adoption of emerging technologies, especially blockchain, machine learning, and AI can really transform the customs and, and uh, trade supply chain processes. Let me quickly share some slides with you. Uh, let me know if you can see the screen. Yes, sir. Now we can. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so this is uh, again an initiative that we drove with the ASEAN uh, member states, uh, together with ASEAN Count, ASEAN Secretariat, and US ASEAN Business Council, to bring forward the awareness and creating uh, a collaborative joint effort to bring a solution to customs using blockchain AI uh, machine learning. So. <clears throat> As we speak about digitalization, generally today, there's a big drive, a need for exponentially more computing power, right? Uh, we are well aware that digitization of everything was aggressively accelerated by COVID-19 and has spurred innovation in new models of working, learning, uh, et cetera. Technology, as we all know, is increasingly central to every aspect of human existence. At this slide, uh, right, as you can see, there are almost about 100 billion intelligent connected devices today, uh, a concept commonly known as distributed intelligence, right? So as you can also imagine, with all these distributed intelligence comes big responsibility that of managing the data, right? The, 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 the sheer volume of data that is transmitted today, uh, and it comes with pretty unique challenges too. Right, uh, And it's also very clear moving forward that governments will soon be dealing with bigger volumes of data and, and the experts are already talking about Yoda by, right? Uh, where if the, the data is not managed properly or structured properly, you will be requiring millions of servers to manage that, right? So there's no doubt that while data area is indeed upon us today, moving, storing, and processing, all of this data is significantly part of the bigger uh, puzzle of the movement, right? So that is where Intel is, is creating that awareness and try to bring in partners to build solutions on how these emerging technologies, uh, AI blockchain can help move, move this data, organize this data, and reap the power of the data that we have today uh, using blockchain and, and, and AI or machine learning methods, you know? Um, today, <clears throat> typically it's, it's all manual work, right? Uh, once we have it in system, the amount of data power that we can gain, that is what also we are trying to tell the governments uh, to understand the possibilities of how these things can be used to move forward in, in a better efficient way. 
right? For, for a, <clears throat> I'll give you an example, right? Imagine a world where compute actually comes to you versus you seeking to migrate data to various sources and compute. And today this is possible because of blockchain, right? Uh, and we presented, this is the platform that we are using to present our case to the ASEAN government. Uh, traditionally, you know, you bring all the data into one place and then you move it into compute. But we are saying now is, hey, you keep the data at your place, we bring the compute to you and we, we move it along and we analyze it and whatever whatever program that requires it. And of course, there's a question comes up along the way, right? Um, how can we trust it? How can we ensure the compute is not tempered? Third party or unwanted party seeing the, the PNC materials and stuff like that. And for that, Intel has a solution called Intel SGX. It's called Software Guard Extension. It is predominantly now uh, being layered in most of our, our CPUs. And this gives that additional security uh, that most of, our, of the users are, are scared of in terms of sharing that uh, into the new emerging technologies. Now with that, <clears throat> let me give you some, some uh, snapshots of what are the uh, projects that we are working with the ASEAN governments uh, using these emerging technologies. There are actually three three business cases that we are working on at a, at a different progressive level. But the first one is with the Vietnam government, we have signed an MOU to bring blockchain to their entire customs process. Uh, we have completed the POC. Uh, we have completed testing phase one and phase two. Uh, and now what's happening is uh, Vietnam government has <coughs> ordered to uh, upgrade the infrastructure, digital infrastructure to cater for all these advancements. Uh, so they're very aggressively moving forward. That's number one. Uh, number two is the ASEAN Digital Transformative Program that I'm going to talk about today. This is a collaborative work within ASEAN Secretariat, uh, US ASEAN Business Council and Intel, not only to create the, the, the awareness and sharing about the emerging technologies, but also to demonstrate how these technologies can really uh, transform the current customs process that's, that's pretty much many manual in, in, in ASEAN today. Now, the objective of the program was very simple, to simplify customs and trade process uh, and policy through adoption of scaling digital solutions. And what we are offering is a solution based on machine learning, blockchain, or AI. And of course, uh, ensuring policy reforms, once we have uh, taken up this adaptation, we also need to ensure some of the policies need to be reformed uh, <clears throat> to set the current scenes. And in particular, uh, we are focusing on customs declaration and clearance process. Now, addressing the problem, uh, when we when we talk about this to the ASEAN member, member states, uh, they threw at us uh, the common problems that they are facing today and how uh, can technology can, uh, can solve this to them. So these are some of the things, uh, but not conclusive. I think manual paperwork process, transparency issue, uh, heavily dependent on human, how blockchain can, can help that, record retention, reporting accuracy. Uh, we all know this. Connecting to industry. Now, this is an interesting area that I want to stress that <clears throat> what we are telling is today, uh, all the companies are submitting report to the customs uh, uh, to, to validate what is the inventory, goods at hand, balance at hand, scrap, and et cetera, et cetera. What we are offering is we are trying, we are offering a connective system from the company direct to the customs. So the customs can, can see the real time inventory at hand, uh, the goods movement, how much you have scrapped, where things are moving and all that kind of stuff. So today we have actually started this, this initiative with Vietnam. So Intel in Vietnam is partially connected to the uh, Vietnam custom system. Uh, although it is not fully yet, uh, we're working towards it. So that's kind of like where we are. And I know a few other companies has also started this. Uh, and today we are also doing this active engagement uh, with Malaysia, uh, where we want to have a direct connection with the Malaysian customs to Intel. It's all visible to the custom office's eyes, right? Uh, besides connecting to the <clears throat> uh, industry, I think, blockchain, AI, and all that, these solutions also give a, a, a valuable connection within government agencies, right? Uh, Interchecking and all that stuff, not only internally, but also externally, uh, let's say India, Malaysia, right? Uh, through the, the single window system. So all this kind of stuff is possible today. The other thing that was brought up to our attention was the red flag and fraud detection. How can blockchain or AI system can, can 
can catch this reflex at early point, right? And of course, um, the other protecting government revenue and, and security and data privacy concerns, including cross-border data flow, uh, which we talked about. Now, after hearing all this, uh, we did a poll survey with the ASEAN member state, 10 member ASEAN state member states uh, of say, okay, we understand your concerns and you, you are happy uh, to adopt technology, but you say you have also other concerns. So what are the real concerns that's really stopping you from bringing technology into play? So of all the, the questions and all that, these are the three main areas they have, uh, we, have, we have got the results from. Number one is cost, funding and infrastructure issues. Not all member states are uh, <clears throat> well equipped with funding, right? And, and also such issues. So how can uh, a, a blockchain system address this? Number two is ease of implementation. We know uh, technically, traditionally, if you want to implement a, implement a system, it's going to be heavily resourced, time, um, connectivity issues. And one of the, the specific uh, uh, reasons given to us, right? Hey, today we have some kind of online system that we use. Can the new emerging technologies connect to this, vice versa? We do not want to let go of this, right? And of course, the third one is the security of the transaction we talked about. So these are the three things that they were brought to our attention. And what we did is uh, last September, uh, during the ASEAN uh, Meet Council, we presented a white paper called Optimizing Data, Digitizing Te and Technology to Foster Trade Intelligence to answer to all of these, these concerns. And in there, we used uh, our Vietnam case as one of the, the, the current case at that point of time, uh, machine learning examples. And we also quoted, uh, you, Erosian uh, customs uh, business case. So there are five countries in the Erosian Union which adopted a single technology within the five countries uh, for movement and uh, uh, customs uh, declarations and stuff like that. So we, we brought that benefits to show how those five countries are benefiting in the movement of goods. Right, And together <clears throat> to address the three main concerns, we are trying to say that we are trying to offer a unique plug and play concept, something like a, your smartphone app, right? You download an app, you use it for free, uh, but as when you need some extra features, <clears throat> you pay a little money to get that extra feature. So this is kind of like the thing we are trying to bring to the table, uh, technology solution as a driver together with that uh, security with Intel SGX. <clears throat> So this is what we presented to them uh, last September uh, together with the white paper. And they were very pleased. And so they gave an action item back to us saying, that, okay, we hear you, this is nice. Can you really show a product demonstration of a real system that's gonna, gonna show all this, <clears throat> the plug and play concept, how it's gonna be so cheap to implement with secure and all that. So we have actually completed that system uh, and we are going to present to them next month, uh, April, mid of April. And that system will showcase the flow of, right from the starting of a company, uh, <clears throat> creating an order, submitting it to customs and how customs can, can use that blockchain AI uh, technology to, to uh, analyze that application uh, in various areas and then how to approve or not approve, rejecting and all that kind of stuff. And we also include, <coughs> have included our, our trading partners at the customs brokers uh, role. So that's kind of like the, the demo system that we have uh, uh, prepared for them. And this is actually a screenshot of that system. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, one of the, the important thing is the potential fraud uh, at the bottom there. So, and this is all customizable uh, as, as a, how you need it, how you want it, what are the data fields that you want. Um, so as you can see uh, on the left-hand side, the, the benefit and all that, I think we talked about it at length. So this is where we are today uh, with, with the ASEAN initiative. Um, there's, there's, there's been a lot of discussion, especially on the, on the fraud, uh, government uh, revenue uh, protection, TPT, uh, how, to, how to make sure the TPT is reduced so that you know, customs can satisfy the customer's <clears throat> delivery. And as the, other, the other focus area was the amount of that we're gonna get after we use, uh, are using this blockchain or AI, what are we going to do with the data? What can the data translate into uh, for both industry and as well as customs and government? What can we achieve with that, with that mega data that we're going to have? Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> so, and lastly, uh, third, the, the third project, we just started off with the Malaysian government to really bring a POC on AI uh, for, a, for a, a, a customs concept called licensed manufacturing warehouse. Today, we have started the design uh, <clears throat> project. This concept is today, this process is 100% manual. Everything is 100% paperwork. Uh, right from the application of the license up to termination of the license. Uh, <clears throat> there are approximately about 350 steps manually today. And with this blockchain, we are going to reduce it to only 25 steps. So that is the latest project that we have embarked uh, as our part to help the industry and customs uh, moving forward with emerging technologies. So with that, uh, I end my presentation. Uh, welcome. Uh, if any questions or comments, and I can I can happily share that white paper if anybody's interested. Uh, I can also happily um, arrange a time if anybody wants to see that that new customs demo system for ASEAN. Uh, just reach out to us, and we'll be happy to share all that. Thank you. Thank you much, sir. Actually, there are one or two questions. Uh, if I can take them up. Sure. Um, there is a question with us from Nasim Kuchi. Can this blockchain be used only in government sectors? Uh, can this AI and ML with blockchain be used in private sectors as well for increasing the profit volume in real time by saving energy and power with labor and employee role with an efficiency of economic growth? I think they are trying to say how it can be used in the private sector. Uh, it's in yes. the chat room as well, sir, in case you want to read this question. Now. Okay. Yes, uh, this is a base platform uh, we have designed for customs. I think it is it is customizable for many, many different areas. And today, I think there's one, one request coming in from Malaysian Tourism Board uh, to use this to some of the digital uh, uh, digitalization for Tourism Board today. Uh, so, yes, it can be customizable um, and workable. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, if any other question comes, I'll uh, certainly uh, direct them to you. Thanks a lot yeah. once again, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so now it's been uh, more than an hour that uh, we've been all patiently listening to our speakers. And I'm sure uh, you're all having a good uh, learning time right now. I think we should pause for a moment now to re-energize ourselves. So I would request you all to please sit back and relax. So, uh, you know, because it's time to engage yourself now in a little bit fun activity. And um, now I'm going to invite Miss Ambika, our Intel AI for Youth coach, to take you through some fun AI experiments. Over to you, Ambika. Hi, thank you, Swati. Hello, everyone. Um, so I think the session is going on pretty. And to add a bit to it, since it is on blockchain, we have a very fun Kahoot quiz with all, for all of you to re-energize yourself and to reinforce on the learnings that you have been having throughout this session today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share the game pin with you all through which you can log into this quiz. The idea of having this quiz is to, uh, you know, uh, see if you know about blockchain well, fun facts about it and also to uh, have a bit of entertainment so all you need to do is you need to go to www.kahoot.it i've put the link in the chat section you can go to that link and i'll quickly start sharing my screen I hope it is visible to all. Yes, pin, yes. Yeah, pin is mentioned on the uh, screen as well, and I'm putting the pin in uh, the chat also. Seven eight seven four three three. This is the pin. So all you need to do is go to kahoot.it, enter this pin, give yourself a cool nickname. Uh, you can use your name or maybe any other name as well. And let's get started. Till the time everyone is joining the Kahoot, let me tell you how it works. So as soon as I click on start, 
uh, questions would start popping up on my screen as well as yours. And with those questions, would there be uh, there would be options? Some of them are multiple choice questions, and the others are true and false statements. So you need to select the correct answer in the least possible time to score the highest points. The one who has the maximum correct answers in the lowest time taken would win this quiz. Okay, we already have 35 participants. We'll wait for two more minutes for everyone to join. Okay, let's begin. Have not joined so far, you can keep on trying. First question, what is a blockchain? Read the options carefully and then answer them. Two seconds. 29 correct answers. Yes, it is a distributed ledger on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Absolutely correct. You, If you haven't joined the Kahoot, uh, you can try joining it now. The pin is there in the chat section and you can uh, resume from the place. Lady Dawn is on top. Hello World is second. PNP third, Rajendra fourth and Ani fifth. Let's see the next question. What does P2P stand for in blockchain? That was that the responses are coming in quite quickly. Forty correct answers. Yes, it is peer to peer. Let's see if the scoreboard has changed drastically. Hello world is on top, Ani on second, PNP third, RPA fourth, and my cool nickname on fifth. Let's see the third question. Who was the creator of Bitcoin? Okay, let's see how many of you know it. Thirty-six correct answers. Satoshi Nakamoto, right? Okay, what's the status? PNP is now on second. Name on fourth. That is cool. Next question. Fourth. This is a true and false. The creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, is still unknown. Is it true or false? Thirty-four correct answers. Yes, it's true. It's still unknown who Satoshi Nakamoto is. And this changes our scoreboard. Ani is on first, my cool nickname second, then Hello World, PNP, and now we have PJN. Fifth question, which term describes a blockchain split? Nineteen correct answers. It's known as a fork. That mentions a blockchain split. K. 
okay pgn is now on fourth and pnp on fifth let's see the next question what was the first real life bitcoin transaction well this is sort of a fun fact do you know about it Twenty people. Yes, you won't believe, but the very first real life Bitcoin transaction was for two pizzas that costed ten thousand bitcoins. Too expensive. Okay, the first two positions remain unchanged. PJN on third, Hello World fourth, and Margit Bakshi on fifth. Seventh question. There are only five hundred different cryptocurrencies in existence today. Is this true or false? Absolutely. It's false. There are more than seven hundred, or I can say nine. No, sorry, seven thousand or nine thousand cryptocurrencies that are in existence today. Okay, all five correct answers. Great. Eighth question: What are the uses of Ethereum cryptocurrency? Twenty-eight correct answers. Yes, all of the above can be used for sending currency, executing smart contracts, uh, processing payments, supply chain management, etc. Okay, the lead, uh, scoreboard has changed. Me on top. Hello world. P J N. Martik Bakshi and my cool nickname. Uh, my cool nickname is again in top five. Ninth. NFT is a type of cryptocurrency. Is that true or false? Twenty-seven correct answers. While we have twenty-one wrong. So NFT non fungible token is not a cryptocurrency but can be uh, understood as a, a digital investment like an in art or something. Okay, the leaderboard has changed a bit. Ani is now on fifth. Oh, that's a drastic fall. Okay, this is going to be the last question. What was the upper limit set for Bitcoin generation? Again, a trivia. Yes, twenty-one million. Twenty-one million was set as the upper limit for Bitcoin generation, and so far, more than nineteen million bitcoins have been generated already. So we will soon be reaching the upper limit. Okay, let's see who the top three of our Kahoot quiz are for today. So on the position we have my cool nickname with nine out of ten. Second we have P J N with ten out of ten, and the first is Hello World with nine thousand two hundred and thirty one points, ten out of ten. Congratulations to all of you! I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I request you to please uh, mention your names in the chat section so that we can congratulate you. Thank you, Swati. You may now take over. Thanks a lot, Ambika. It was indeed a lot of fun and refreshing. Congratulations, hello world, and congratulations to all of you.
Okay, uh, we are now going to proceed to our next session, uh, which is going to be a panel session on role of artificial intelligence in customs risk management. For this, I would like to introduce our moderator for the discussion, Mr. Vasudevan Rajkopalan. Mr. Vasudevan is a senior management professional and regulatory expert in the area of logistics and customs clearance. He has hands-on experience of more than 25 years in express logistics, warehousing, transportation, sea and air freight, project transportation of over-dimensional as well as heavyweight cargo, container stuffing, and planning. Also, I'm going to introduce our distinguished panel for today's session, uh, Professor P.J. Narayanan. So you are the director of International Institute of Information Technology, Hyderabad. Uh, with research contribution over the past 25 years in areas including computer vision, computer graphics, and parallel computing. Our second panelist is Mr. Arvind Gupta. So you are the head and co-founder of Digital India Foundation, a policy think tank working in areas of digital inclusion, smart cities, internet governance. Um, you were also the CEO of MyGov, an initiative of Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi to empower citizens of India with participative governance and digitally communicative schemes and policies to all Indias. Our third panelist is Professor Bhiksha Raj. Sir, you are a professor in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. You completed your PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 2000 and have been on the faculty at CNU since 2008. Your areas of speciality are AI and ML, with special emphasis on speech and audio processing, privacy, and security in ML, again, with emphasis on the context of audio and on forensic analysis of voice. And our fourth uh, panelist for the session is Mr. Amit E. Bala Ratnam. So you head the overall functioning of the EICI Express Terminals, at international airports and work closely with various central and state government departments on policy matters, for business development, compliance, and service standards for the express industry. You have also worked jointly with Indian Customs on process formulation and implementation of the express cargo clearance system across various Indian international airports. With this, um, I hand it over to you, Mr. Rajkopalan, to um, you know, get started with the panel session. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Swati. Uh, I think it's an absolute privilege to be in the midst of so many uh, eminent people and sometimes I start by thinking, you know, what is it that I really add value on when we have so much of experts here. It was nice to also hear Mr. P. N. Pandey as well as Mr. Akresh Pandey and Mr. Narayana. So without much ado, rather than me speaking much, I would probably invite each of the panelists to uh, kindly give their views just so that uh, we first hear your views and then take it forward if that's okay. Uh, if there's no particular order, so whoever wants to go first, I think that will be uh, absolutely fine. We have too uh, many, uh, Vasudevan, we have professors in the classroom, they need to go first. <laughs> and then the will come in later on. So. I think it's better you call uh, Rajagopal, otherwise, you know, there'll be confusion. You call, you choose. Yeah, Mr. Naran, and I think since you spoke, I'll start with <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks for uh, the invite and uh, greetings to all the fellow uh, panel members uh, and the speakers before. Uh, it was very interesting to know the range of activities that Customs uh, Department is doing when we are all aware briefly about it, no, vaguely about it, not uh, not very detailed, but I'm really impressed to know that a lot of digitalization has already happened and, and the kind of initiatives they're planning on, especially the AI side, I can a little bit I'm familiar with, I'm not big of expert in, in, in blockchain side of things. Uh, I, I see there are many uh, activities or many initiatives have been planned. I think it's it, you know, there's a lot of scope today. You know, the, the early uh, uh, you know, digitalization, converting everything to digital, was the initial thrust of when computers came into picture in the first 50 years. But now that has happened, or mostly everything is digitalized. Now, what do we do with it is the, is the most important thing, that is judging or, or using the data. So AI, I mean, in the initial 
years AI was about game playing and all that, but now we realize that every organization, so customs or the any government department is an organization, it can use a lot of AI to, in, to improve itself. And particularly, a lot of examples were given on, on, the, the, on the shipping data, customer data, production data, the, the uh, courier data, and so much data, and so many customers being uh, represented there. This is a huge wealth of information and, and tons and tons of processing can make things much better for operation. A few things were outlined by Mr. Pandey and I, I, you know, I wish, I hope there's being done and we will be glad to be, you know, many in, in India will be glad to be part of that. In particular, there, there was a reference to, to image processing or image analysis, analytics for, uh, to, to get information. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of documents which are still, in some sense, uh, you know, physical. So photographs of them can automatically be parsed and, and information collected today with, with, the, with the kind of image processing and language processing combination of these two. Similarly, you know, the X-ray of uh, these packages being made and, and they've already mentioned that they want to do that. That will be something that will really help, you know, analyze the packages over a different uh, segment, different parts. And then there is also, I mean, uh, this also my reference was made to it about, about you know, protecting the privacy and the secrecy of the information. We are now living in the era of hundreds and thousands of very, very innovative digital frauds or online frauds. We all get calls, which, uh, you know, which, which we get nearly fooled into some of where we get fooled also. So, I mean, so all the, the privacy aspects of uh, this data processing is, did not attract that much attention in the early years where the euphoria of processing things was took over. I think now that has come uh, back into focus. So that has to be, that's a layer that on anything that we do, we have to apply that, we have to think about that thing. And otherwise, you know, I see a lot of scope for, uh, for uh, customs or any government department of this kind, of this scale, to be using uh, you know, image processing or language processing or geo information uh, to, to uh, make you know, data better. I mean, the, the, the word intelligence in, in the world of uh, you know, customs, et cetera, there's also a associated entity called BRI, right? They're the world, the, the, the uh, revenue intelligence. The intelligence that is used to, to mine is, is about the data mining, you know, where, where artificial intelligence dealt with intelligence up here. But I think the data mining is the is more like the intelligence, the DRI or the customs or the government, the police, they all need intelligence of that kind. So there are many scope. I will just stop here and let others uh, have their introductory remark and we'll discuss later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Narayana. I could probably re request Mr. Diksha Raj to Professor to give a few words. That's okay with you, sir. You're on mute, sir. You may have to unmute. I was asked to actually make some slides, so I did make some slides. Can you let me share my screen? Yes, yes, please. That should be interesting. So uh, currently only I cannot share. Uh, Swati, do we need to give any uh, rights or anything like that for Professor to share his screen? Uh, so you already have the speaker rights. Okay, so now uh, I got it. Excellent. So uh, let me see if I can pull up my basic cards. Not for some reason it's not showing me the screen. That's this is this is strange. It just give me a second for this is. I guess I'll just do it with Sir, so well, Meanwhile, we can request uh, Mr. Arvin Gupta, sir. To... Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that should be absolutely fine. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I see. Let's see. Okay. Oh, sorry. I can see you. Uh, all right. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Bhikshar Raj. I'm a professor in the Language Technologies Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. I have affiliations to various other departments there. Uh, I work on speech and audio processing, machine learning, deep learning, security, and privacy, and a lot of related areas. This is our lovely campus, Carnegie Mellon. And uh, some of the stuff, anything that I'll be talking today is not merely about my work, 
but I'm sort of building on the experience and knowledge I've got from all of my colleagues at LTI, which is the largest language technologies institute in the world today, and, uh, and other research groups. The research group I work in is MLSP and speech. Now, when I was invited to this panel, I was told what the topic was yesterday. So I reached out to a few people to find out about the state of uh, AI and how customs and such like are using it in India. So I want to thank uh, Srimati Priyanka, who is in the IRS, Joint Commissioner of Customs and DST in Hyderabad. Uh, Sri Kamal Jain, who is the Director of, Director of Cargo and Logistics, and uh, Sri Satya Narayan, who is from IRS. He used to be the CGM of the Container Corporation of India. So all the information, everything, my slides and my information are built on uh, information I got from them. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I have very little additional information to add over everything that are really very august uh, uh, panelists uh, have already discussed so far. But what I found from my discussions is that the key areas where AI could be of relevance are information access, of course, supply chain management, compliance and conformance check, disaster management, and fraud deterrence. Now, in this context, as an academic, we don't really build giant systems for corporations or governments. We, we build prototypes, we work on research, which we hand out to other corporations or, or agencies. So the four examples I'm going to give you are work that some of which I am really, I have been uh, uh, part of and others which uh, have been done by my, by my colleagues. So uh, our group has been working with the security agencies in the United States for several years now. And this has to do with, among others, shipping in of contraband. So uh, the uh, Coast Guard centers get lots of fraud SOS calls. The whole point is somebody says, I'm, I'm drowning, help me. Now they have limited resources. So they have maybe two helicopters and three boat, four boats in that area, they send them out. And while these people are otherwise occupied, contraband gets brought in, drugs, other kinds of shipment, uh, even sex trafficking. And so the, anytime any kind of call comes in, they are required to respond because people might be dying, but then these, this, is, this causes so much uh, damage to the country because of fraud that they end up ended up reaching out for AI solutions to deal with it. And so we built technologies where we analyze, and the only thing you have is a voice recording in these cases. So we analyze voice and audio recordings, and we, have, we try to tell them who was speaking, what kind of person was this person. Uh, if you look into prior records, has this person tried to pull a similar stunt in the past? Uh, where are they most likely? Are they on water, are they in a boat? What kind of equipment have they been using? Things like that. Now, everything is AI driven. And what we find is that uh, my colleague Rita Singh has uh, worked on over 250 cases so far for Coast Guard uh, and security agencies around the world, in fact. And several suspects have been arranged. We find that being able to do this relieves some of the pressure on these agencies who are in charge of protecting. Uh, not merely the borders, but also the economy of the country from contraband and such like. So this was one. Uh, here's another. Now, when you go to Walmart or when you go to Amazon or eBay or any of these stores, they don't really do not, mostly do not own the stuff that they sell. They just happen to be the centralized point where the other sellers come and upload their information. So at this point, if somebody comes and asks for shoes, they can get a catalog for 5,000 different types of shoes. Are there really 5,000 different types of shoes? No. So we are left with this humongous challenge of trying to organize this highly unstructured information, often based on maybe one photograph and a little bit of associative text. And this is a logistic nightmare. It's a regulatory nightmare. It's a conformance nightmare. And we've been working on solutions where we can, uh, based on historic records, based on everything else that we can get, how we can 
uh, analyze these data using computer vision, NLP, and other AI to organize them for the customer. This one's a huge one. Uh, this is work that we've been doing with a giant uh, aircraft company. So uh, they have, this is something very similar to what the government has. Tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of pages of documentation and usually in PDF form or maybe online. But then there is this workers suspended from the ceiling 30 feet above the ground working on an engine. And he wants to find out how much torque do I need to tighten this one little lever. And he's going to ask a question and post a photograph. The traditional mechanism before AI kicked in was for some people on the ground to go and dig through all of that information to give them the right information. Otherwise you had experts, human experts, and human experts could make mistakes. So this entire thing has now been largely automated where AI technologies using NLP, AI, uh, and, uh, and then other AI tools have organized this highly structured hundreds of thousands of pages of text into an information database. They can, they can obtain voice-based queries from this person suspended way above and translate it to the right information to find out what question is being asked pull up the appropriate information and present it to this person up there with near 100% accuracy. And this, as you can imagine, there's no comparator. Say we've improved throughput over our, some other system by X because this kind of thing hasn't really existed in the past before, before uh, companies began building on it. So this has been a life changer, basically changes the landscape of business or disaster management, something that we were doing for the government of Chile. So uh, they have earthquakes, they have other kinds of Chile is particularly prone to earthquakes. Uh, they have uh, dozens, uh, they have, uh, uh, anytime a disaster strikes, there's gonna be widespread chaos. There's information from hundreds of different places. And all of these have to be coordinated and turns out coordinating, coordinating all of this completely chaotic information and getting an organized response, which is in terms of directing traffic, sending first responders, uh, calming down the public, all of this can be very challenging. And once again, AI comes to the rescue. So uh, if you look at the various uh, obvious extensions of such technologies to where AI might apply, in the case of customs and such like in India, uh, all of these, I have several examples on my slides. I'll actually stop over here and hand over to the next panelist. But it turns out that pretty much all of the different challenges that have been mentioned in the, in the uh, session so far can indeed be addressed by modern AI. And uh, it's kind of ripe. So the examples I showed in terms of what we have actually been worked on, they are not the only ones. There are dozens of others and some of which are directly applicable, applicable to the custom scenario. Again, they're almost there. And uh, what I have learned over the past couple of days is that our customs agencies in particular are way out there in terms of adoption of technology. So we are probably at the cusp of making life really easy and making the the job of doing business in India, very simple. So I'll stop over here and hand over to the uh, next panelist. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, interesting, maybe a few points I could probably ask in the next opportunity that I get to speak. Uh, can I request uh, Mr. Arvind to give his views, please? Uh, really interesting discussion going on, but please. Yeah, hi, uh, good afternoon now. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, yes, sir. clear, uh, it's visible. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, from my experience, uh, both uh, inside the government and as an academic and as a practitioner. So um, um, that, that's, uh, that's that probably puts me um, uh, with these August panelists. 
to talk about what I am observing from a very high level as well as some um, some issues uh, that we've seen actually roll out in real time. Um, a lot more application of AI in the government, a little bit of blockchain, and especially when we talk about uh, supply chains and uh, uh, and the whole uh, uh, logistics supply chain, let's put it that way. So um, all of us know this. I think I'm, uh, you know, uh, today uh, we are living in this fourth industrial revolution, which is a, a combination of uh, one key resource, really computational power, really harnessing one key resource, which is uh, which is data. And uh, I think, um, uh, and the reason I show this slide is that uh, while India skipped the first three industrial revolutions, this is one industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution that I think we are in the in the midst of, where India is actually doing things we should be proud of. It's very, it's very uh, groundbreaking. We are um, we are leading the world in many many efforts, and uh, a lot more can be done. And and and, and these kind of backlogs, uh, capacity building uh, exercises are of course a welcome change. So, um, and and it is it is clear that this is not only impacting just one area. But it's impacting everything that we do around us. Uh, and um, I, I could go on and give many examples there, but today's discussion, I'll limit to something on the supply chain side. Um, the, the next point I do make is that while this is happening and um, what we are seeing is Indians have become immensely digital. Uh, today, in the last eight years or so, since I've been associated with the various initiatives uh, around digital India, uh, I can share that this number of um, 825 million, which is 82 crore internet users today, uh, was about 12 to 14 crores uh, eight years ago. So in, in the last eight years, this number gone up six to seven X. And that really makes us uh, talk about the second thing, which is why we have gone digital. India has done the second other thing, which I think um, which no other nation has done, is to build digital public goods at scale, at population level. And why this is important uh, to be discussed here is that today we have technology where data can be captured um, and, and uh, can empower the users at any level, from, from citizens to governments to, to any part of any supply whether it's a digital supply chain or a logistics supply chain or a medical supply chain or healthcare supply chain. We have so much of data being generated. Everybody in this audience is, I'm sure, aware of this whole Aadhaar stack, the India stack that we have, starting from identity to, to the EKYC, DigiLocker, to the payments, the UPI. The UPI is producing about 5 billion transactions a month. Um, uh, that's, uh, and India, as a total, is doing actually probably about 40 to 50% more transactions than one of the world leaders in electronic transactions, which is China. So, you know, this is the, the bit sizing of... Um, payments that has caused so much of data to be produced, data, data footprint to be produced that we now can match uh, just about everything. And then um, Professor uh, uh, Raj from Carnegie Mellon mentioned about GST. Um, GST is a great example. And with, combined with the, the airway bill system uh, that now we have um, uh, the, uh, the live real-time tracking of uh, not only invoices being generated, you cannot fake invoices, the fraud detection, but also the whole supply chain logistics is being managed. You cannot just create an invoice, which then uh, uh, you can be used, or you, can have, you cannot have duplicate invoices, you cannot have multiple invoices. Having a single uh, source of producing uh, validated, reputated data documents is now the GST system. So. Uh, even um, uh, you know that 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 has single-handedly uh, led to so much of um, um, efficiency in the in the um, in the whole uh, uh, movement of goods, and I think that itself is a case study of how a small fraud detection uh, system using uh, uh, using AI can really help in uh, in detecting uh, and and ensuring that you know people are going with more valid documents and not just a piece of uh, duplicated paper. And of course, the last thing, which is uh, which is why we are discussing AI today, is the source of the uh, of all AI is data. So, how who controls the data? We have the fifth layer of the India stack, which is a constant layer, what we um, fondly call the DEPA architecture, uh, data empowerment and production architecture. All this combined today are digital public goods. It's available to everybody to be used. 
Uh, and because it's available to everybody to be used with the right set of um, interoperability, uh, what this does is this puts us in a very, very unique position. Um, and whether we disrupt supply chains or we disrupt any other uh, function, uh, we have the power to do that. And, um, and the two other things I do want to mention, and uh, that's why I, will, uh, th I was presenting these motherhood slides, because what is also happening is we're seeing a lot of being produced in uh, regional languages. And uh, the interesting part is in, in, in India's income pyramid, it is not just the top end of consumers. We have to lay participation from all levels of uh, digital natives in India, all levels of digital migrants from India. So we have, we have data about being produced about everybody. So this, is, this has been a very inclusive um, movement where, where everybody is leaving a data footprint, has control over that data, and that is, that is really enabling um, a lot of interesting decision making. The other point that I want to want to highlight from the slide is the voice part. Um, voice data is becoming um, a very, very big uh, uh, strength and uh, asset um, in India, given the voice diversity and the, um, the, the, uh, the diversity and uh, uh, in educational levels, people are doing more, more, more interactions on voice. And I will give you some examples and how this has been used um, in especially what uh, Professor Raj was talking about, so interesting in the in 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 in, in getting those alerts from um, from the security agencies. This is one of the things that we are doing is to understand voice and uh, especially again and that same example. If you just put out the U.S. Postal Guard and put the Indian Postal Guard, that is actually true, and it is it is actually happening here. So, um, so what are the three key messages uh, before I move on to other important things? Is India is number one building digital public goods at scale that is population scale. It's not small pilots. We are building digital public goods at population scales. Indians are going massively digital, producing so much of data that uh, we are becoming data rich before all of us are becoming economically rich. So these are the three key things that we are seeing as overall overarching trends. Um, as we move ahead in India, and uh, with the and the advantage with digital public goods is that because of digital public goods, the trust in the system, the trust in data, uh, is very very high, and uh, this has been one of the core reasons for adoption at all levels, uh, and uh, all all um, all qualitative and quantitative research is showing that trust factor, the trust and neutrality of platforms, is playing the highest role when it comes to adoption. Um, so what, where is that we are today? Today, because of this data exhaust, because of this massive data exhaust, everybody's innovating on top of the data to give, let's say, credit, uh, to give help, and I'll talk about uh, logistics and health as an example, education, and so many other applications that, uh, that are getting rolled out as we speak. So um, if, you, if somebody follows the unicorns, I know there was a quiz going on about Bitcoins and which what value of bitcoins and who bought some pizzas. If you ask the amount of um, uh, unicorns that have been produced in the last one year, um, fifty percent of the unicorns will somewhere be connected with fintech, credit. Um, another twenty percent probably with education. Another ten percent with health. So there's a lot of um, lot of um, good new startups innovating on top of the data exhaust that we have produced. Um, Coming to two specific examples, um, I talked about this. This is uh, if, if my good friend, uh, the current CEO of uh, MyGov is on this uh, group uh, or on the discussion, uh, Abhishek will tell you, we, we did the, um, the, one of the biggest AI voice hackathons. See, I, as I said, Indians are, uh, uh, we are, we are good at talking. Um, we also have a lot of call-in numbers. Uh, and in these call-in numbers, people come and give comments or give grievances or uh, these are voice voice based systems, and they 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 are we have enabled a MyGov as a platform where it is not just digital or on a smartphone; it's also on a on a voice call. So you can call in and give give feedback, give comments, and ask questions and things like that. Side benefits of that was that we were able to get twenty thousand voice samples of at least fourteen different languages. And in these fourteen different languages, what we were able to do is use uh, in a uh, you know deploy a hackathon where our smart innovators actually could um, get access to this data. This is, uh, 
and this 20,000 is just samples. It's good and with with transcribed samples, and we were able to now create more accurate algorithms, which um, which none of the uh, um, big platforms in the world were able to do, and crack the code of if people were speaking voice in a in a language other than English Hindi, will we be able to translate it automatically? And this is now open data. This is what is being built out. Currently, as we speak, as voice um, voice stack for India again as a digital public good. This this has been applied um, to to many speeches. This has been applied to many other, and it has worked um, in in uh, in, this, in you know it's it's been highly accurate. I don't have the exact numbers of whether it was seventy percent or eighty percent accurate, but I've been told it's it's an upward um, accuracy is more than seventy percent plus. So um, that is the kind of uh, work we've been able to do. To develop this as public goods. Now, imagine the impact of this in um, in enabling healthcare or supply chain, and in, you know, having only data being uh, being textual data or data points being generated on a digital platform. You also can have voice commands and voice uh, voice data being uh, converted and actioned uh, as we as as we go along. The other big example I have, and this is something um, is a great example, not just in customs, but in general of supply chain, is this whole vaccine deployment platform. The greatest use of AI um, uh, technology today has been our COVID and the EVEN platform working together. EVEN is the electronic vaccine intelligence network. 28,900 cold chains were mapped. Daily basis. 28,900 cold chains were managed on a daily basis. I'm repeating that. And, and, and we were able to deploy more than 100,000, 1 lakh vaccinators a day, uh, which then, you know, somewhere did from anywhere from 3 million to 25 million vaccinations a day. So to do this immense amount of front end, you needed a lot of supply chain management, making sure the vaccine flow is happening, it's happening in a cold chain, um, uh, uh, and, and it's going to the right place where and um, how to manage the demand with the supply, and, and it is reaching in time, and there is no lags, and there is, this is this has been the case uh, over the last 400 days or so, that this is the, this platform has used uh, I call it in self mode AI at scale, at population scale to deliver the highest vaccinations uh, in, in, uh, that we've ever seen in, um, in, uh, in human history. So um, greatest use of AI and uh, from even, which is the vaccine intelligence, from barcoding it to batch, batch numbering it. Um, so a little bit of blockchain use there and making sure that, that the, the supply and demand that is coming from the front end is correctly matched with the back end and, and the right logistics is done all on a, on, uh, on a, uh, uh, autonomous uh, AI based system so that we are able to then, um, you know, there is no least amount of human intervention that is required. And then only you, we could achieve this population scale. So this is one of the greatest example. The story is still not like 100% published because we are still on, it is still ongoing, but this is, uh, this is something that is uh, something that we all need to be uh, talking about. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just repeating what I just uh, said. And uh, I think uh, Professor has already talked about the, uh, the, the customs, so I, I will not discuss this case study of the customs already using it. With this, I, I do want to just uh, thank the organizers one again and wish uh, the rest of the conference uh, the very best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Erwin. Uh, quite uh, interesting points. And then uh, something that comes out is, you know, Data seems to be uh, important everywhere. Uh, in fact, this was spoken by uh, Mr. Pian Pandey, Mr. Akhilesh Pandey, again by Professor Raj, Mr. Professor Raj uh, Narayanan. Uh, I would probably now I would also invite Mr. Amit Balaratnam to come in. You know, Amit Balaratnam, because I know him, I'm also from the express industry, and uh, I can say technology uh, has actually made our what I uh, uh, fondly say as happy hands, because I say happy hands because previously courier clearances were all done by manual clearances and uh, we are talking of 10,000 uh, millions of shipments getting clear. So there was carbon paper everywhere. So you could always see that hands are either black, brown, blue, whichever color of carbon that was used. But now uh, I'd say now the 
people who are washing clothes may probably feel happier because the shirt remains white and not black blue and other colors that's on a lighter note but yes technology has made a big difference so can i ask amit balaratnam to uh, share his views please thank you vasu thank you for the introduction uh, thanks to everyone uh, uh, it's indeed a pleasure uh, for me to be here and to participate in this very interesting discussion uh, interestingly uh, mr p n pande and mr akhilesh pande have already covered a lot what we do what uh, vasu and and i do but uh, i think for the benefit of all i'll i'd like to share a small presentation and talk about what is it that the express industry is doing uh, with ai with the government uh, and how we as a industry have been using technology for a fairly long time to ensure that we are able to provide uh, speed uh, to our customers in terms of moving their goods globally so without any further ado let me please share with you some of the points will be common uh, beg my pardon for that yeah so a little bit about eici we are actually a trade association which works in india for the express industry uh, we have various express companies and e-commerce companies who are our members and uh, we have been uh, we were founded way back in 1997 with the sole motive of ensuring that the industry has a voice in india and uh, we also hold ourselves responsible as an industry towards the country towards uh, you know the rules the compliances that with cross border uh, logistics um, with domestic logistics as well we have partnered with the government uh, on various projects uh, interestingly eccs uh, which is the express cargo clearance system is a system that was jointly initiated way back in 2005 as a ppp project between uh, indian customs and uh, eici to jointly ensure that we are able to automate the express clearance systems in india and bring them at par with what we have experienced abroad in our networks uh, we also uh, do initiatives with the government on skilling uh, because we are a very very heavily uh, manpower driven industry so it is very important for us to ensure that we have trained manpower and uh, of course with the government providing a lot of uh, support uh, and a lot of encouragement uh, we've been able to take uh, this skilling initiative uh, quite far within the industry and we continue to do that a little bit about the business uh, i'm sure most of us already know what the likes of uh, a dhl or fedex or ups or a dtdc or a blue dot blue dot does on the domestic or the international level we basically pick shipments uh, from the doorstep of the shipper and we deliver it to the doorstep of the consignee in a matter of hours we basically sell uh, speed we spell uh, we we uh, you know we sell uh you know our speed and our technology to the customers because we already know that uh, you know moving goods is uh, already something which has been one of the oldest uh, professions in the world uh, we've just made it a little faster and we try to do the best we can in terms of providing best possible services to our customers globally as well as within india a little bit about the industry in india uh, the industry is fairly old now uh, it took a bit of time for us to sort of set a footprint for ourselves in india uh, to be known uh, as what we are not just uh, someone who's picking uh, shipments from your doorstep and delivering but there's a lot that goes into it um, globally we are a fairly large industry we are about 250 uh, billion odd uh, industry globally in india we are at about 6.4 billion uh, we move a fairly large amount of shipments annually within the country domestically as internationally Uh, the express operators who operate globally have a good presence uh, in the aviation side as well they fly in a fair number of cargo planes uh, in and out of india this ensures that we provide dedicated space uh, for the time uh, you know for the time uh, delivered product that we actually go to customers and sell uh, a fairly large uh, employer as well we are estimated to be employing about 26 lakh uh, people as we talk today within this year so uh, these are just some of the industry uh, you know um, figures i'd also like to share with you on the global level we are we are operating in about 220 countries and uh, because the the network is so large for all of us we have to ensure that we bring in a lot of infrastructure and there's a lot of technology for that in a year we move about 10 billion shipments uh, in these 220 odd countries and to do that we need to have a lot of air and a lot of ground network which is working very very closely very well aligned and of course it has to be backed by a lot of strong tech, lot of tech 
so we ensure that we bring in that sort of uh, you know uh, expertise to the table for our customers globally uh now coming to what we talk about what was already spoken about the eccs clearance system um, so well uh, by uh, by mr p n pandey and mr akhilesh pandey um, from the government side uh, this is a project which indeed has brought us to a very competitive level in, in you know globally when we talk about cross border clearances and i'm talking from the side of the business side of uh, you know of the stakeholders that that we represent uh, initially like vasu did mention you know we were a very paper driven industry uh, any time uh, you know that we had to clear packages uh, which is 24 by 7 uh, 365 days in a year we would always be indulging in a lot of paperwork paperwork is not just about bulks of paper from the location of the express company to customs and back it also involves a lot of uh, consumption of time a lot of uh, back end work which goes into managing that paperwork because obviously we are dealing with the law we are dealing with the policies of the government so we have to ensure that the compliance levels are always kept at the highest possible levels uh, when we looked at automation what we decided to do was uh, and uh, you know i must highlight that the government was very very forthcoming in this way back in 2005 that the system had to be had to be completely online it it would should not be a half paper paper uh, based and a half electronic based system so with that in mind uh, the system of eccs was developed to ensure that every single activity that was done was all done on the electronic system just to give you an example uh, you know when we upload the uh, clearance documents for a package uh, for for a courier package we are talking about express now uh, we upload a bill of entry or we upload a shipping bill now these are electronic documents that we can upload that were already there uh, you know as as how the industry has progressed or or cross border clearances have progressed over the years what we were able to bring to the table as something new was that we were also able to upload images of the documents for every single package that means if in the us had to ship something to uh, say somebody in say delhi uh, when they upload when they hand over the package and they receive an airway bill they would also be handing over some documents uh, could be an invoice could be some literature of the package or could be any document you know related to the clearance of that package uh, that documentation very conveniently is now uploaded into the clearance system of customs along with the data of the package which ensures that customs sitting in any corner of the country uh, multiple departments of customs are able to view the details of the package and the literature without having to be presented with hard copy paper or without having to go through the drill of actually being at the site to view the paperwork which basically also enables customs to provide a remote screening of of the documentation that is already put up into the system the second thing that the system bought out was uh, aligning the physical package movement in the gateways when i say gateways the, the you know the, the courier terminals that are controlled by indian customs when the package arrived with the data so uh, what what basically this did was that these handheld barcode scanners that we see at uh, shopping malls at shopping marts uh, those same uh, scanners which are already being used by the were being used by the express industry for decades and decades were bought into the customs clearance system so now what happens is that when an express company is bringing in say 100 odd packages into bombay and the data is already uploaded into the custom system when the package arrives at bombay port that is the customs clearance port for courier uh, the data of that package is already in the custom system custom knows that these packages are already arriving they do what they, they already have the ability to in the back end work and process whatever they have to in terms of uh, clearing the package holding it for examination or for assessment what happens is when the physical package arrives at the facility at the bombay port the handling agency there or the custodian there is using the handheld barcode scanner able to scan that box and immediately provide the input into the eccs system that the package is arrived which ensures that the uh, actual availability or visibility of the package is there in the electronic system of indian customs this also ensures that there is availability of that status to the final customer that is the importer or even the exporter for that matter in the eccs uh, mobility app or in the eccs tracking system something which is very very common in the express industry when you send a package you want to know where it is so you just go into the system and you punch the number you know where it is so this ensures that there is a lot of transparency 
this ensure there is a lot of uh, answerability on all of us in the industry to ensure that we provide the service that we sell to our customers we have this in our systems but now when we have it in the custom systems we become more answerable all of us are more answerable there is more transparency and we all know where we are headed in terms of of a packages life through the entire supply chain so eccs in that sense has been a uh, really a game changer for all of us from the industry side i can tell you just to add to what uh, shri akhilesh pandey was saying the dwell times which were on an average 6 to 7 hours after flight arrival until the packages were out of customs clearance has come down to almost 120 minutes uh, or some in some cases even lesser uh, and this is attributed to the system technology that we already have here uh, needless to say that uh, the system is enabled with risk management which is already spoken about by uh, you know by our distinguished guest mr pn pandey uh, the system when it went live it already had that system in place so uh, it ensured that the transparency levels were very very high it ensured that a customer who was shipping through the express network into india or out of india knew that the package will go through a very high level of compliance and only then it will move forward so this also ensures that there is a lot of transparency there is a lot of uh, you know oversight by the department on the way business happens on on you know in the cross border environment so yeah this is a little dccs i will not talk more about it because it's it's already there in the open uh, vasu probably in the course of the discussion can share coming to how ai can help uh, you know customs risk management uh, i think eccs is a very big example of that there's enough and more that is already happening uh, with indian customs in terms of enabling this we already have uh, a lot of work that is happening uh, between customs and the express industry uh, when i say express industry the express side of it as well as the e-commerce side of it to ensure that we are able to provide transparency uh, in terms of what is actually moving what was rightly said by one of the, the earlier speakers was that today uh, because of e-commerce there is there are thousands and thousands of customers whose pack whose packages are actually transiting through this network or actually using the express mode to actually bring packages into india which are directly delivered to them so this also opens up a wide range of challenges for the regulators in terms of managing the sort of products that are coming in in terms of ensuring that there is no duty evasion uh, in terms of ensuring that there is a proper system in place to ensure that there is facilitation for those who are importing and exporting without any uh, negative remarks so to just a few you know uh, when we when we talk to the regulators we we look trying to bring in some more alignments between our systems and their systems uh, which could ensure that examination which is something you know uh, which is uh, 100% activity in in uh, in the courier business in india any and every package that is moving in and out of the country has to be 100% x-ray screened to ensure that it is complied with from a aviation security perspective as well as from a regulator perspective that is the custom side uh similarly when we look at uh, you know uh, aeo aeo is a very very big program that uh, you know has uh, of course taken uh, the indian exporters and importers to the next level of business uh we can always look at seeing how uh, you know those customers who don't have any sort of red flags uh, and are not aeos uh, you know ai can be used to ensure that they too get into the aeo program without having to go through the entire process of self application this could be something that could be looked at because we are looking at a environment uh, in indian clearance systems where every system talks to every system the departments within customs are already having visibility of what is moving through uh, you know through the borders uh, through various modes could be seen there could be expressed so why not we look at uh, you know a system where there are exporters make a lot lot of small time exporters or importers who can be brought into the aeo aeo program using uh, ai uh, just to you know give you all uh, some more insight about express there are a lot of smes there is a lot of msmes who use the express industry because they do not have the bandwidth to have large logistics departments or large teams working for them in house as externally because of cost so we become their in house uh, logistics service providers in every way possible um, so we bring them close to the global markets we also ensure that they are provided the service that you know any large exporter or importer uh, enjoys so an aeo program getting extended to a lot of them through ai with the way the systems are being aligned uh, by the government uh, 
from the customs perspective would go a long way in terms of enabling that rms is already very much uh, there it ensures that we are all in line that the industry behaves uh, that exporters and importers through us behave uh, but i'm sure it can be taken to the next level by uh, ensuring that the uh, various targetings that they do are probably also enabling our uh, you know in terms of uh, bringing in more business in terms of opening more business channels so yeah this is a little bit about um, about what we are what we do we as an industry already are doing quite a bit of ai um, in our systems in our warehouses we already use uh, robotic arms for auto sorting of packages uh, because that ensures more efficiency uh, more accuracy for us we are also using uh, ai and blockchain uh, for customer specific needs customer profiling uh, where customers need specific sorts sort of uh, logistic services including thing of goods could be pharmaceuticals which require temperature control which need time definite delivery there are systems in place through ai and blockchain which are ensuring the complete monitoring of such movement of goods globally uh to ensure that the packages these medicines reach the uh, you know their final destinations without being tampered and in time so yes there's a lot lot we are trying to do and we continue to work closely with the government to ensure that we provide the sort of services and the transparency um, that is expected out of us as the express industry in india so with that i would like to thank thank everyone for having me on the panel thank you uh thank you amit quite an exhaustive information on the express industry but that yeah i think uh, the pandemic really uh, helped in pandemic in the for the express industry it was useful in supporting lives actually uh, when oxygen concentration of concentrators were in demand etc uh, eccs played a very big role uh, the way customs operated and the other partnering government agencies uh, if i may ask uh, a, you know view actually maybe to uh mr arvind uh, what would uh, you were speaking of gst sir you know where uh, gst has actually made a huge impact in the logistics people may not have told but then i think uh, in probably in valiar border trucks would stand probably for you know four five days now it's going off very fast so there is the idea of uh, one nation one invoice with ai blockchain would there be a concept of one nation one submission in the sense that i submit one document say to one agency like gst and then that data automatically goes to customs or it goes to whichever uh, agency uh, just a broad thought because you have been behind so many ideas can i take your views on that sir well so um, i think uh, number one uh, you know i i as i said i wear three hats one of the hats uh, as a as a as an academic and as a practitioner i'll say yes that is the most practical thing to do you make it once and it distributes it automatically uh, but when you have worked inside the government you know that the complexities are um, on um, a multiplicity of jurisdictions and um, and the fact that uh, this data flow um, might happen technologically but it also has to happen from uh, from a bureaucratic jurisdiction perspective um i think that's where the challenge lies it's not the technology uh, let me assure you it's not the technical challenge it's not a it's not a, um, uh, something that we we think it's an undoable it's more of a uh, multiplicity of jurisdiction uh, uh, the whole problem of uh, you know where does it originate where does it end who ends up doing actions on that so i think um, uh, but that vision is correct what you are saying is a correct vision that is something that we desire i mean if i submit um, my data and with interoperability the way we have at at population scale i shouldn't be uh, i shouldn't be do, uh, replicating that uh, again um, uh, crisis but in during crisis this whole oven platform should give us some inspiration uh, this whole icmr uh, portal should give us some inspiration you give your Uh, samples to a lab and if um, you know and that uh, the whole uh, because of one unique identifier which is your in in our case will be gst and number the data gets um, uh, and in, in the case of the lab test it's your aadhar number it gets populated in icmr and rgs so to in coven automatically so that that learnings from there uh, should be applied um, and, you know in in, uh, in especially gst so i think now that the systems are stable this will this will see the reality uh, in, in the near future thank you thank you so much yes i should 
uh, you know, put on record. Swift has made a big difference, single window that customs introduced. The COVID, all of us have used and all of us have got benefited. And uh, the pandemic has been one fantastic way of actually digital use. Even now, we are all, don't have to go to work from home, but then you do all the work. Uh, with that, can I ask uh, Professor Raj on his, uh, you know, uh, because um, Mr. Harvinder also spoken, like how you did it for the US on the coastal coast guard. Uh, what's your view of what could be done further or your vision that you could, that could be used in India, if I could uh, seek your view. So uh, the uh, actual problems between India and uh, the, the US are not going to be very different. We have essentially all the same challenges, right? Uh, now it's not just voice. The uh, bigger challenge that we have is trying, we find is finding the, uh, the signatures of anomalous behaviors. This was, this was also mentioned earlier by some of the speakers. Right? So anomalous behaviors range from uh, you know, voice calls to, to uh, uh, shipments being made, my money being transferred, all of these anomalous behaviors have to be tracked. The problem we run into over there is the trade-off between privacy and uh, uh, security over here and uh, conformance. And it's not really clear to me where the balance lies. Now, India has this fantastic platform where we have digitized biometric signatures for basically the entire populace. And so that gives us opportunities that other countries don't have in terms of being able to track strange behavior, strange, pat uh, strange patterns, uh, you know, uh, stuff coming in at different locations at different times. Uh, across time, the longitudinal uh, behavioral patterns and such like. But all of these are related to crime. In the bigger picture, even if you're speaking about just what customs is doing, there are other situations where uh, AI can come in. So disaster management, for instance, you have all of these docks, containers are being offloaded. There are still lots and lots of people over there. It's not automated, they're not robots uh, uh, offloading containers. They are not robots counting the number of boxes coming out of these containers still, right? Uh, they, are, they are humans being, uh, or humans working in these systems. And things like, are these people wearing their helmets? Has there been an accident? Has there, is there a fire someplace? All of these uh, are critical and almost ignored aspects of the problem uh, of the process which AI could go a long way into detecting, alerting, preventing, which actually affects the overall process of commerce. So there is that aspect too. And once again, the technology is there for it. I think uh, got disconnected. Uh, you know, Professor Narayanan, you know, uh, a very uh, uh, interesting yeah. point that comes again uh, because Professor Raj spoke of safety, uh, something that I was not aware could, could be done through uh, artificial intelligence, etc. Uh, yeah. The immediate point that comes to me, there are two points that comes to my mind, maybe you can guide, is, you know, the minute we say we are putting technology, there is also a school of thought that say, will the jobs go away? That's one. Two, of course, how can it make life that much more uh, you know, better? Because that's a very interesting point that Professor Raj brought safety. Uh, your views, sir. Yeah, so definitely, I mean, there are there are lots of things that in any workplace can benefit from by use of modern AI uh, technologies. Uh, so there were a large number of, uh, you know, systems made where you, know, you place a camera or surveillance camera or uh, will we'll detect if you are wearing masks, for instance, during the, the or at least one you, okay, distancing. I mean, these are you know, these are fleeting uh, value because once the pandemic is over, nobody cares about them. But things like construction sites or uh, the sites of where, where you exchange packages, etc., they, they, they will remain. So beyond that, I have a suggestion you know, uh, to, since uh, NEGD and D digital, uh, you know, India, all the, everybody is here. And see, it is clear that the there is a lot of digital data today in the customs and associate the shipping express all this uh, this system i mean the, the 
and uh, there is a lot of uh, at least some efforts in in using it for gaining understanding gaining more analytics and gaining insights so to prevent fraud to increase efficiency multiple reason but whatever has been done can be nothing but just the tip of an iceberg there's so much more can be done i have a suggestion that and, and i don't know what are the implementation agencies and companies how you know the governmental agencies like customs deal with but there is a lot of scope and this has been happening in other areas now of if you can create some of the data that is and make it publicly usable with all the safeguards uh, you know uh, privacy protection anonymization whatever is required but if customs related data or shipment related data or relate such data i think making it uh, publicly available for startups or academics for others to use this will give a huge fillip to you know to that that can directly be adopted so i would request uh, ngd or i mean i think the, the government the authorities in the government are are here in this uh, in this meeting they they should be the right ones who can who can take that steps and uh, you know there are enough agencies academics many of us can help with you know the safeguards like anonymization and and uh, no no able no you know sensitive information is not revealed commercial information is not revealed these are very important obviously but i think i, I believe all this can be done and a huge volume of data that is in 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 proportion to what is today's ai if it's made available it will be helpful to academically helpful to startups it will be helpful to the department so i would like to place this request in front of everybody who is now get this thank you thank you uh swati do we have more time or uh, is there any questions that you would want to that press come in the chat box that you want to post uh first uh, thing yeah yeah swati please no go on go on mr basu please no no i thought i'll first thank because uh, i don't know how much of time more is left i see solid we actually time. yeah yeah we are, we are actually pretty much on the time uh, i see the speakers were kind enough to answer the questions of uh, uh, you know the participants in there so i don't see any questions out here um on that note um, uh, mr Ma uh, mr vasu anything else you would like to uh, say to conclude no, the fun yeah. session no i think this has been quite a, a, a amazing session in fact a lot of learning for me here uh and then i i a common point that comes out is there's a lot of data available uh india surely has been uh, when i hear uh, mr arvind or i hear uh, professor raj or i hear mr martin or amit i understand and i'm i'm sort of re getting reconfirmed you know that i always propagated that india is far ahead on time in terms of the way we are using digital and then the way things are moving across at least in the logistics front and in the regulatory front seems to be a very bright uh, thing and this i fondly tell to mr akilesh pandey that you know we are ahead of the curve when it comes to especially the single window concept that was introduced in india because you are now uh, world over we don't have these multiple participating government agencies in one uh, one channel where you can do work together uh like they say in this pepsi ad no dil mange more you are never happy <laughs> one <laughs> right and uh, so uh, but that's possible because we have uh, such bright people and uh, there's a government's wish uh, you know vision of the very world that digital india is we are moving towards the world where we are moving paperless so i think i will not take more time swati i'll leave it in your able hands to take it forward thank you so much Sure. Thanks a lot, Mr. Vasu. And now I will request uh, Mr. Satya Narayan Meena sir to, uh, you know, deliver the vote of thanks and uh, closing the match. Yeah. Thank you, Swati. Uh, it was indeed a very informative and interactive session, and I hope um, purpose for which digital India dialogues have been initiated as being made to considerable extent. It is now time for us to conclude the session. I hope each of you. gain insight and learnings to take away from these sessions on behalf of ngd i would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all the eminent speakers for sharing their experiences knowledge and wisdom with us i would also like to express my appreciation to all the participants for their presence in making 
this program productive. Here, I would like to mention a big thank you to our president and CEO, NEGD, Sri Abhishek Singh, sir. Under his dynamic leadership, the DID program was envisioned and conceptualized. His guidance always inspires and pushes us forward to take new initiatives. I would also like to express thanks to Sri Vinay Thakur, CEO, NEGD, for his continuous backing and support. These closing remarks would be incomplete without a mention of our esteemed collaborative partners, the UNDP and our Intel team. They always bring the best of experts and industry practices from across the globe to make every session rich with insight and takeaway learnings. Last but not the least, a huge appreciation for my capacity building team for managing and coordinating the session so efficiently, and also the awareness and communication team for facilitating to reach out appropriate audience through various social media platforms. And we hope to see you all again soon in the next sessions, the detail of which will be available in uh, our DID website very soon. And here, uh, there, is, there will be a link to a feedback form in chat room. Uh, request, please put it on this thing. May I please right. to take two minutes to fill for this. We also request you to follow us on our social media platforms where we share our latest uses cases on this application of digital technology to improve the delivery of citizens. And thank you all again. Have a great product today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank Have you. a great day all. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much.